Grace and peace be with all of you this morning. Today is Reformation Sunday. This is a big huzzah, hooray, whooping day in the Lutheran Church. We remember what happened that started 501 years ago, right? Last year was the 500th 500th anniversary that gave birth to Protestant churches like ours, like the Lutheran Church. But I have to tell you, I find this practice of Reformation Sunday a little strange. It's a little strange, this big huzzah, hurrah thing that we do for Reformation. And there's a couple reasons. The first reason why I find Reformation, remembering this year after year, a little strange is because right now, in the past few decades, less and less people are loyal to one denomination or another. It used to be people were lifelong Methodists or Lutherans, but nowadays a lot of people just consider themselves Christians. And you may happen to be going to a Lutheran or non-denominational or Presbyterian church right now, but you're just a Christian. You're not that loyal to a particular denomination because less people, especially in the U.S., really care about a lot of the differences between denominations. So it's a little strange in that climate to make such a big deal of the Reformation. And the other reason, I think the more important reason why this is kind of a strange day is because when we have this big celebration for Reformation, it looks like we're celebrating a split in the church, a time where we failed to work together, to work out our differences. Sometimes we look at Martin Luther in this kind of romanticized uh, American image, like he was this great uh, guy with American values. He was this rebel out to stick it to the man, right? And then he went out and had this entrepreneurial spirit and left the church to start his own thing. Except that's not what actually happened. Luther never wanted to start his own church. He wanted to reform and renew the church that he was a part of. He wanted to change things from within, but they couldn't work things out, and so he was excommunicated, kicked out of the church, and forced to start his own thing along with the other reformers. And Luther, Luther had his faults too. Luther was a little bit a little bit more than a little bit rough around the edges. If you know anything about Luther, he had quite a temper on him, and after he was excommunicated, he got in the habit of saying things like the Pope is the Antichrist again and again. You can see that throughout his writings. You can actually also see that he had quite a foul mouth. Luther had all these creative and vulgar insults he would use against his opponents in the Catholic Church, things you wouldn't want read in church today, That's part of Luther. He was pretty rough around the edges. And don't get me wrong, God was working through him. I have no doubt about that. There were changes he brought about that needed to happen in the church, and so many people got that message of grace and love that weren't receiving it before. And it was the Roman Catholic Church that kicked Luther out. However, he has some of the blame for making things worse. And in fact, because of some of his attitudes and some of the things that he wrote and said in his lifetime, throughout the centuries, that has affected the relationship between the Catholic Church and Protestant churches still today because of some of the things that he said and the attitudes that he had. So in light of this, why do we bother celebrating and remembering the Reformation year after year since it's kind of a complicated history, good and bad with it. So I think that we remember the Reformation not because we're claiming that our brand of Christianity is better than everyone else's. That's not why we celebrate the Reformation, as if we've got it all figured out, but those churches down the street, they don't know what they're talking about. Come to the Lutheran church, we've got the only truth. No, we don't believe that. That's not why we're celebrating this. And we're also not celebrating divisions in the church, times where we fail to work together, to work through our differences and be the one body of Christ at work, because that's what we're supposed to be. So we don't celebrate those things, but there is still a good reason to remember the Reformation year after year. And the reason is we believe that we are a part of a church that is still in the process of reforming. We say in the Lutheran Church that, in fact, we believe the church is always reforming. We are always being made new. And after all, that 
is the story of death and resurrection. That is the story of death that leads to new life. That was what was happening in the Reformation. In Luke chapter nine, Jesus says this, if you want to become, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross every day and follow me. Because Jesus is saying you have to be willing to die to yourself again and again and again to be reborn. You have to be willing to let some things die so that God can breathe new life into you and make you new. And so we die to the ways that we live only for ourselves so that God can make us new so that we can live for others. We die to the ways that we have turned away from God so that God can make us new and turn us back in the right direction. And we die to the ways that we've become too comfortable with the world and with our church the way it is so that God can make us new by opening our eyes to see the people that are left out and to see the ways that we need to change. It's always this process of death to life, death to resurrection. That's how we are made new. That's what this process of reformation that never ends is about. And so we remember what happened 501 years ago, how God was working in the church to breathe new life into them so that we can figure out how God is doing the same thing with us today. So we had a a confirmation Martin Luther retreat this weekend. So Dave Gruenberg, such a great teacher, he'll tell you that there's no way you can make all the points of the Reformation in a few minutes. Right, Dave? Cannot happen. Barely happened in a full weekend. So instead, I just want to lift up two things, two things about the Reformation. Indulgences and grace. Indulgences and grace. So indulgences was the big first issue that Luther was really mad about. But to understand indulgences, you have to understand the idea of purgatory. So the church taught that purgatory was this place that you went on your way to heaven in order to be purified. Now the reason that this idea came about was because heaven has to be perfect. Heaven has to be this pure, clean, spotless place place that is absolutely sin-free. But we all know that we are not sin-free that we commit lots of sins during our lives, and that attaches to our souls, and so in purgatory, all of those sins we committed, they have to be burned away over time through that suffering, through that process of burning. Then we're made clean so we can be sin-free enough to go into heaven, which of course meant the more sins that you committed in life, the more tallies on your bad sheet, the longer you would spend in purgatory. Now, it's not hell, Everyone in purgatory eventually goes to heaven. You just might have to spend a few hundred years burning first. Not that bad, right? But but the church had a solution. The church was so great. The church had a way to help you out. And more importantly, really help your loved ones out that are already dead and burning in purgatory right now. So they said, all you have to do is fork over a little money, is to pay and buy a little bit of indulgences, and then we can shorten that time in purgatory and get your loved ones out early. So picture what that would be like. If you believed in this system, someone that you love died, and I said to you, you know, I'm so sorry that your grandmother passed away. I know that you loved her. She was a good person better than average, but everybody sins a little, so she's going to spend at least a hundred years burning and suffering in purgatory, unless you hand over your next two paychecks to the church, to me, you can write it out to Pastor Tony Katko, and then, then she can be in heaven today. These people who were selling these indulgences, they took a lot of stock into marketing, they had good campaign slogans, The favorite one I remember is, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. What an abuse, right? Clearly an abuse going on in the church. Now it's also important to remember that the medieval Catholic church is not the Catholic church today. The Catholic church does not sell indulgences anymore. They stopped that in 1567, so it's been a little while since they've done that. Don't blame them for it now, okay? There is a difference. But at the time, this was a horrible, abusive practice of bad theology. And who do you think suffered most? The poor, exactly. 
the poor, because the people who giving the little that they had would really affect their lives, but they still loved their loved ones who were dead, and so they would do whatever they could to help them out if they thought they were burning right now. Wouldn't you? Of course you would. And so Luther demanded that this practice of selling indulgence and stopped. He said, first of all, this isn't real, and this is abusing people. You are abusing your power in the church. So Luther said, you've got to stop it. Because obviously the church had lost its way. The church, following Jesus, was supposed to take care of the poor. Instead, they're taking advantage of the poor along with everybody else. And so that practice had to die so that the church could be made new so that the church could reclaim what it was supposed to be, providing good news for the poor, as Jesus said. And today, Catholic social services, Lutheran social services, Lutheran world relief, there are lots of tangible ways that the church does provide for the poor. Because practices like that, they had to die first so that church could be made new and become what it was supposed to be. So that's indulgences, and then the second thing about the Reformation is grace. There's a lot more, but this is is the important point number two. So Luther, throughout most of his life, through a lot of his life at least, was really afraid. He was plagued by fear and guilt. He thought God was this angry God who was out to punish you, and if you didn't do enough, then God was going to send you to hell. God was going to really get you. And so he was always trying to repent. And you could never be sure if you'd repented of enough sins. You could never be sure if you really trusted God enough, if you'd done enough good works. You could never be sure if you were safe from that angry God. But then Luther found out that that's not who God really is. He found out in the Bible from passages like the one that Pastor Tim read from Romans today. That's really the core of Lutheran theology. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift. It's a gift. Some of what the opponents of Luther would argue is similar to what a lot of Christians believe today. So ask any Christian if they believe in grace, I bet you anything they will say yes. Of course, we believe in grace. We believe that salvation is a gift from Jesus, and Jesus does most of the work, but you've got to do a little bit of it. You've got to do just a little bit of that work to really accept that grace, to really earn that grace. Jesus did most of it, but you've got to do a little bit of it. And Luther said, no. That's not what it says in the Bible, and it's not good enough. Because if we have to do even a little bit of something to accept that grace, then guess what? We'll never be sure if we've done enough will live constantly in a state of fear, wondering if God's going to punish us for all eternity. And so that idea, that idea that we had to go to God, that had to die. The idea that we could somehow earn or lose God's grace, that had to die so that we could be made new and really experience what the true gift of God's grace is. And you know what happens when we're not living in fear anymore? Then we can love our neighbors, not because we're afraid God will punish us if we don't. We can actually love them out of response of gratitude for the love that God has for us. Because after all, that's real love. Loving someone because you're afraid that God's gonna kill you if you don't isn't real love, is it? You have to be able to choose to respond in love. So there was the death and resurrection, that death and rebirth to new life with grace and with indulgences. But the question is, that's great, that happened 500 years ago, some of that still applies to now, but how is God breathing new life? How is God making us new as a church today? You may have heard, you probably have heard, that the church in the United States is in decline. Have you heard that? The church is in decline. There are some churches that are growing numerically, but really across the board, and especially in mainline Protestant denominations like ours, year after year, attendance, numbers, and churches, they're getting lower and older. Year after year, that's the reality in a lot 
of churches across the United States, and there are less Christians, less people in the Lutheran church. There are some people who say that the church is shrinking, and there are even some who go so far as to say the church is dying. And they're right. They are absolutely right. The church as we know it right now is dying, as it's always being dying and reborn, death and rebirth. Because the church the way it was isn't the church that it's going to be. It has to die. Things have to change for us to become something new, for us to be what God wants us to be in the future. That's what death and resurrection, that's what reform continues to look like. While it's true that the number of Lutherans in the United States and in Europe is shrinking, actually the numbers of Lutherans across the world has been increasing steadily over the years. There were more Lutherans this year in the world than there were last, and there will be more Lutherans in the world next year than there are now. Because that growth, that increase in numbers, it isn't happening in the US and in Europe, it's happening in places like Africa and Asia. So the Lutheran World Federation, most Lutherans, Lutheran churches belong to this. It makes up 74 of the 80 million Lutherans in the world. And in 2016, they released some numbers of their membership. And the, the top, the largest church in the LWF was in what country do you think? Ethiopia, yep, with eight million members. And the second largest church in the LWF, the Lutheran World Federation, is Tanzania with six and a half million members. The ELCA, by the way, it falls number eight on that list with around three million members. There are more Lutherans of color in the world than there are Lutherans of European descent. So you know what? The Lutheran church and the, Lu and the church as a whole is growing, it's thriving around the world. It just looks different than it used to. It looks different. And I think that's the reality here, too. That even as some numbers decline and the culture changes, there are some amazing things happening today that weren't happening before. Church just looks different. It's a new church than it was before, and it's going to continue to die and be made new. We talked about this in our Wednesday night Bible study, and someone pointed out that some churches in Africa and Asia, places we think of as mission territories, they're now sending missionaries to the U.S. and to Europe because now we are the real mission field. Do you see the potential here? Not just across the world for evangelism, but right here in this community, in Columbus, Ohio, there are lots of people who have not experienced the love and grace of Jesus Christ that Luther reclaimed in the Reformation. So what are the new ways that we can help them see and hear and experience that love. And if you're worried, as many of us are, of the decline of the church in numbers and in wealth and in power, I get it. As someone who's employed by one of those churches, believe me, I get the fear and the anxiety. And there are people that are afraid that what if Christianity becomes a minority in the United States? And I just want to tell you Remember that that's how it started. That's how Christianity started, as a poor, small, persecuted minority group. And look what God did with that. Who knows what God can do with us today? So we don't have to worry about the church dying forever. It will die, as it always has been, so it will be reborn into something new. We don't have to worry about if the church will survive. God's got that. We just need to ask ourselves, what are the things that we need to let go? What are the things we need to let go of? The things that we are full of so that God can fill us up with something new. What are the ways in your life and in this church that we can let go of something, that we can change something to allow room for God to do something new, to breathe new life into us as a people of faith. And I don't know, I've said this before, I don't know where God is taking us, 
I don't know what the future is of Christ Lutheran Church or the ELCA or the Christian Church in America. I don't know where God is taking you in your life, but God's taking you somewhere. Even if it feels like death, maybe it is, but it's a death leading us to someplace new. God is always breathing new life into us. And thanks be to God for that. Amen.